Delighted to be back here again this year, and I'm excited to introduce to you Congressman Trey Hollingsworth. Uh, he is formerly an entrepreneur. He was elected to Congress in 2016 to regulate to uh, represent the 9th District of uh, Kansas, and uh, he is one of an emerging group of leaders on the Hill who are really bringing us forward on technology. We have the opportunity to listen to people like Congressman Foster and Congressman Meeks and Con Congressman Hollingsworth. So please join me in welcoming him. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, we do have Mark Zuckerberg in town, and I understand you've got some time constraints this morning, so we're going to move quickly. Indeed, when Zook comes calling, right? You better be on time. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a character in a novel by Ernest Hemingway who's asked how he went bankrupt, and he says, at first gradually and then suddenly. And I think that we're in a situation like this. We see all this change around us, and it's spiking, and mm -hmm. we need to catch up to it. So why don't we jump right into the elephant in the room and talk about how you're looking at policy on privacy. It's a great question. Uh, this is something that every industry is really beginning to grapple with and certainly Congress is beginning to grapple with as well. For my own part, we have been hosting a series of roundtables organized by industry focused on how we better engage with industry about privacy, right? Because there's a multi-dimensional problem here that we need to better understand. And I think, frankly, uh, we have, out of some of those roundtables that we've had already, we've got some really good legislative proposals to make some progress with regard to privacy. But also, there's a larger conversation that needs to be had from a cultural perspective, right? We need to help consumers understand the immense benefits that they've had because of access to data, right? That the opportunities that are available to them today, the ease of things, the convenience of things, the products that are available to them today that wouldn't be available absent vast amounts of data either about them or vast amounts of data about people generally. And so I think that I'm a big believer there are legislative problems, right? And then there are cultural problems. And we should be really careful because to every legislature, every problem looks like a legislative problem that should be solved with a legislative answer. But there is a broader conversation that needs to be had in America amongst people in an education process and helping people understand the immense value of this data to them and what they might be giving up um, in a transaction to a company that will then be able to mobilize that data, even if the service or product is quote unquote free, but also the immense convenience and innovation that that data is able to deliver. I think you heard Bill Foster talk about how many of the engines of technological growth going forward are gonna be dependent on enormous data sets, right? Um, and making sure that we have access to those, that our researchers have access to those is important, but also making sure that people have some level of accountability and choice with regard to that is really important as well. So this is something that we have delved into I can assure you we have come to no easy answers. Perhaps we have picked the low-hanging fruit from a legislative perspective, um, but this is something more broadly we're going to have to discuss. Do you have a prediction on what the, uh, what's ahead for policy uh, uh, from Congress? Policy generally Timing, from Congress on, on privacy? On privacy. Okay, got it. Yeah. Will we have uh, a bill yeah. and yeah, where I, will it? Uh, who, uh, it's a complicated issue partly correct. because we have financial privacy issues that we right. all in this room look at, but privacy is obviously a much, much bigger. Yeah, uh, we will have a bill. There will be an answer. Will that answer come prior to California's law going into effect or alternatively California enforcement going into effect on July 1? Probably not, right? Congress, as you guys well know, moves at a glacial pace. Uh, I hope that we will take that time, invest that time to get to the right answers. Um, but I am confident we will get somewhere. I don't believe we will get there fast enough um, before California's law goes into effect. Okay. Um, since Mark Zuckerberg is here, I'll share my favorite privacy joke, which is uh, I saw a picture of a little boy sitting at a computer, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg's looking over his shoulder, and the boy is saying, my dad told me you're spying on us, mm -hmm. and Mark Zuckerberg says, he's not your dad. <laughs> right. So yeah. he has his work cut out. Yeah. So let's jump to Libra right. and cryptocurrency, another right. just mold-breaking change that right. is falling into the laps of 
regulators and, right. and the Hill as well. What, what yeah. are your thoughts there? Well, look, I think, um, and I'm excited to see so many people here, because I think this is a tremendous area, whether it's online lending or reducing transaction costs in financial intermediation. I think this is a tremendous, exciting time. I think there's a lot of excitement that should be had around these innovations, because Look, I represent Indiana's 9th District. Indiana's 9th District is very I diverse. Said Kansas. I'm so sorry. I knew that. That's, a, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. I'm sure Kansas is a great state. Indiana is the greatest state in the union. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes, so. I know but, this very well. Indeed. So, look, it's a very diverse district. We've got some suburban areas, some urban areas, and we've got some very rural areas. And I can tell you, in Indiana, those rural Hoosiers, rural Americans, right, feel disconnected from an economy that suburban and urban America participates in. And a lot of that is because of the loss of their financial institutions, right? We've lost half the community banks we once had. We've lost a third of the small credit unions we once had. They feel that if you're going to get a mortgage, if you need a small dollar loan and you live in Salem, Indiana, you are driving 30, 40, 50 minutes out of your way to go make that application. You were talking to a loan officer that doesn't even want to come to your community, that hasn't been to your small community. They feel like they are in a different economy than urban and suburban America. And right, and you guys, in all the innovation, in all the work that you do are able to close some of that gap, right? Are able to reach them through the technology rails with financial products that they need, that they want to have access to, that they can empower their lives with. And I think that's really exciting. That's something that we shouldn't turn our back on. It's something we shouldn't put the big hand of the federal government between because they are really feeling that. It is palpable in those communities that they feel like they can't get ahead because they don't have access to the financial services that are needed in today's economy in order to empower their lives. Whether that's to start small businesses, whether it's to get a mortgage, whether it's to buy a car, whether it's a small dollar loan to fix their transmission in their so they can keep their job, right? All of these things are really important to meeting their diurnal cash flow needs or alternatively to building that better future. And I'm really excited about working with policymakers, working with regulators, working with you guys to empower what you do every single day so that those Hoosiers in Salem, Indiana feel like they have a better and brighter future. And I think that's a story we haven't gotten out enough, yeah. right? Those anecdotes and stories about individuals whose lives were saved, right? Whose lives were transformed, whose lives were accelerated because they had access to something online, through an app that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. That is something we've got to continue to get out. Yeah. It's something I continue to talk about in each of these hearings. There's a lot of fear, right? There's a lot of trepidation. There's a lot of hesitation. I understand that. But at the same time, there should be a lot of excitement, that countervailing excitement about what can we do with this, right? Who can we reach that we couldn't reach before? What type of products can we offer that we couldn't offer before? And I think that's really important for us to remember. It is easy, right, in Washington, D.C., um, to believe that technology is going to be bad. But that isn't the history of technology. That we need to put some guardrails, I understand. That we need to provide a certainty in terms of the regulatory and legal environment, I certainly understand. But I also want to do that understanding that we should be creating a crucible for more and more technology, more and more innovation, more and more product development. I think that's really, really important. And so my North Star isn't this is bad. This is going to rip people off. This is going to hurt people. My North Star is that individual in Salem who is not going to see a community bank come back, right? They're not building bricks and mortar branches right. in Salem, Indiana again. How can we ensure that they have a real connection to the financial services that they need, right? And I think that every district all the way across the country has that type of person, that individual that could be helped and empowered by this. This is music to the ears of this yeah, audience. Right. These are the people who are trying to make that happen. And one of the big challenges is how to catch up the regulatory community right. to the technologies. And speaking as a former deputy controller of the currency, right. it's not the regulator's fault that right. they are slower yeah. in technology. They're designed to be right. careful. But uh, what are your thoughts on the innovation that's emerging? We're seeing the CFPB with its no action letters right. and its um, its lab efforts. And uh, they've put out an RFP now on uh, uh, doing tech sprints, which they're really hoping everyone right. will comment on. And we're seeing FinCEN and yeah. uh, all the agencies really starting programs. What what are you encouraging the regulators to do? And, and what do you think are the messages that maybe they need to hear from Congress to yep. feel empowered? To it's a great innovate? question. This is uh, a message that I'm taking to them every single day. We have organized hearings with FinCEN. We have 
met with the CFPB. We have talked with each of these regulators about a couple of things, right? Number one, we've already talked about regulatory and legal certainty. I can't tell you the number of firms that come into my office and say, I have the greatest idea for a product, right? I have the greatest innovation. This is going to really change the lives of Americans. And I just need certainty around this. I don't need you to fall on my side and say I can do this at no, with no regulation whatsoever. I just need some level of certainty. Is this a security? Is it a commodity? You just tell me what it is and I can live with that, but I just need some certainty around that. Yeah. So number one, imparting to them that uncertainty around the regulatory and legal environment isn't just a direct cost to businesses in terms of the legal costs or in terms of their government affairs efforts, but it is also retarding innovation in the long run, right? It is also slowing down the level of investment and that investment goes elsewhere. I frequently tell people that policy really forms the contours of the land and capital is the water that flows over that, right? If we create the wrong contours and we push capital elsewhere, to develop these products elsewhere, to innovate elsewhere, to invest elsewhere, then we will be worse off because of that in the long run, right? And that's something that's really hard to talk about in regulators that are thinking about just tomorrow, next week, one year from now, and what the headline might be, what the legal case might be, what the judicial decision might be. But I really want to think about this in the 100-year expanse, right? We want this technology to be developed here because it can empower the American economy, empower Americans to live better lives. And I think not thinking about that in the large expanse of time could really be a detriment to us because it will uh, it will cause us to create those contours that push the water, push the capital further afield from I want where I want it to be. And Indian is ninth selfishly, but I will accept an America generally. Um, secondarily, right, I'm a big fan of making sure that we continue the work that they're doing already in innovating within those particular regulatory agencies, right? How do we help allow this technology to get into those regulatory agencies, not only so they can interact with industry better, so they can understand it better, right? I think Bill uh, gave a few examples, but one of my favorites that uh, somebody came in and talked about was, look, and forgive me, I'm no math major. I got a solid C minus in math, probably deserved a D plus. <laughs> but they essentially came in and said, look, we have been running this really, really sophisticated algorithm. And we have found tremendous results in terms of the loans that we are able to make to individuals who previously would not have gotten a loan because of these alternative data sources, because mm -hmm. of what we know about these individuals. And we are able to get them the loans that they need. And we've got a tremendous repayment history. By the way, we're reporting to credit agencies. It's empowering their lives. Many of these people are getting off this product and going to more traditional products, et cetera, et cetera. It's better for everybody. The problem is the Federal Reserve shows up at our door and they test us on these algorithms, but they essentially use, I'll, I'll use an example, they use linear regression, and we're way far ahead of that. We're 10 times that, right? The power and speed of what we're doing is far above that. You can't test us on 1974 technology in 2019 and expect to get a reasonable result, and then they're shocked that they're getting an unreasonable, unintelligible result. And I think that we've got to help the regulators understand what's going on in industry so they can better regulate that. So they're not so far behind the pace of technology, the curve of technology, that they're holding back that curve and our movement up that curve. I think that's really important. Third thing I continue to advocate day in and day out for, and like I said, we had a FinCEN hearing where we brought in top four people in FinCEN. Regulators should be using this technology too. I mean, BSA AML work, by the way, we do that the same way we've done it since 1984. If you deposit $10,001 into a bank in cash, you're going on a watch list, right? If you deposit $9,999, you're not on that list. How many criminals do you think know that? Every single one, right? We do this the same way we've done it since the 80s. It makes no sense. Meanwhile, right, what do I hear from people? This is an enormous data set. This is what AI and ML are built for. This is the real opportunity. So not only do I think these regulators need to understand the outward-facing technology, how to interface with you, how to understand what you're doing to empower more of what you're doing, but also they need to be harnessing this technology for their own purposes, right? How do we regulate better? We send a million times the number of SARS to FinCEN that we should. Their haystack is enormous. The needles are very small, and it's a huge cost. We spend $35 billion a year on BSA AML as an industry, as a country, and what I hear from FinCEN is it's really hard to find the needle because the haystack is so enormous. Because in today's numbers, right, that $10,000 that was set in the 80s, that would be $61,000 today. But we haven't adjusted it all until the bill yesterday that adjusted for inflation. So next year it's going to be $10,180, right? We've got to do better than that yeah. and implement these technologies inside regulators to be able to get to the bad actors faster and not have so many of the costs be borne by the good actors that are trying to do things.
Yeah, the UN says we have a 99% failure rate in yeah. finding financial crime using the old technology that yeah. we have. And I hear about it every single week. My father-in-law runs the longest continuously operated restaurant in Louisville, ah. right, up until two years ago. Only accepted cash, right? I mean, he grew up in the Depression. It is old school. He thinks credit cards are the gateway drug, right? I mean, you start <laughs> using credit cards, who knows what happens to you, right? And so he only accepted cash for the first 41 years of him owning this restaurant when he bought it from his grandfather. Um, and every Monday, he would deposit cash from the weekend, right? Every Monday, he would, be, he would have a SARS generated and sent to Fenson. And so every Sunday night at family dinner, I hear about this issue, I can assure you, over and over again, and how important it is that we make transitions in this and we do a better job for Fenson, lowering the cost for the industry, and lowering the issues that consumers face. We would love to keep talking with you, but I know yeah. you need to get back to the Hill. So please join me in uh, thanking Congressman <laughs> Collingsworth yeah. from the 9th District of Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> well, just before I go, one last thing. Thank you guys for doing what you do every single day. I truly am a banner-waving believer in you guys and what you do and the technology you provide, the products that you provide. I think it's really easy up here in D.C. where you can throw a baseball, even with my terrible throw, and hit a financial institution on every corner. That's not true in Indiana, and they feel that. And the work that you guys do every single day to develop those new products, to deliver those new products at cheaper prices, that is really, really important work. And I'm really, really a fan of what you do and how you deliver it and how it can make a real difference in people's lives. So you guys keep it up. My job is just to make sure you can do more of what you guys do well, okay?